Hello again, and welcome to another episode of <coughs> Kings of the Rink with the writers from sports-kings.com slash around the rink. You can find us on our Facebook page by searching around the rink, and you can find us at our Twitter handle. I can go over this way. There we go. At ATR Sports Kings. My name is Joe, and I'm joined as always for our second podcast by Michael and Kelvin. Boys, how you doing today? What's up, guy? Good. Good. How you doing? Good. Real good. We got a lot of stuff to go into today, so we'll get started right away. I know both you guys are kind of up in arms about this whole deal with the New Jersey Devils getting reimbursed for Ilya Kovalchuk's retirement a little bit. So, for those that don't know, Kovalchuk signed a 17-year deal with the New York New Jersey Devils, not New York, New Jersey Devils back in 2010. And as a punishment, the league fined them $3 million and a first-round pick and a third-round pick. Now, after Kovalchuk retired, the league's now decided that New Jersey's going to get the 30th pick in this draft, so they get their first-rounder back, and they've been reimbursed half the fine, $1.5 million. So let's hear what you guys have to think. We'll start with Michael, because I know that you have a lot to say about this. Do I ever... Okay, first of all, I kind of, in a, in a you know, glass is half full type thing, I understand in a sense what they're trying to do with this. I get that there's new management, new ownership with the new, in the New Jersey franchise, and they're trying to, you know, smooth things over from the old management and old, you know, all that, the old crap that they did and everything. But here's the thing. You can't just up and do this, NHL. I don't care who you are. I don't care what team this is. They screwed up. They paid the price. The new ownership knew what was going on when they got these guys. I mean, how are you, okay, let's say, okay, I'm, I'm, if, if this would have happened to Buffalo or if this would have happened to Washington, Dallas, another franchise, this wouldn't happen. But no, for some, but for some uh, un, un, ungodly reason, I have no idea why, everybody wants to play socialist and, uh, you know, let's, let's give these guys an equal shot at this. They had three opportunities to drop, to, to forfeit their first round pick. They could have had it, uh, you know, a couple years ago when they uh, just barely lost the Stanley Cup Finals to the LA Kings, not drafted Brady Shea. Everything would have been all right. We wouldn't be in this predicament. But, no, they had to have Brady Shea. They had to get greedy. You give up a shot to try to get a guy like Jake Vertanen, who's a speedy uh, right winger out in Calgary, who would desperately help your scoring situation. But, no, now you're, you know, deciding you're going to forfeit this one, and the league's going to kick you back in this one. Where was this when the Rangers lost Alexi Sharapanov? They got like a comp, uh, compensatory, like second or third round pick. He was a first round guy. Sadly, they lost him. Um, lost a battle with a heart ailment. Um, On the ice. And they didn't too, get a I'm first. They didn't get a first round. Yeah, they didn't get a first round pick out of that one. He was a first rounder. So I don't know what the league's trying to do here. I don't get it. This is a heck of a backdoor deal. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm up in arms about this. I am, I'm fuming. Uh, Kelvin, we'll hop right over to you, man. What do you think? It's I, I don't like it either. Um, they lost a third-round pick in 2011. Give them that one back. Give them the 2011 third-round pick back in the third round. Don't give them back a first round plus $1.5 million in a fine. They got $1.5 million back in a fine plus a first-round pick. Uh, yeah, it's 30th overall, but what's that sending to the league? Okay, we're going to go out and work our way around every salary cap deal we can. Exactly. Hope the guy retires within that 17-year period, and we're going to get our money back and a pick back? Come on. Yeah, and it, then, it, it just doesn't make sense. And he didn't, quote-unquote, retire. He quit. He didn't yeah, retire he's still because playing he's in the still KHL. playing in the KHL. He quit. Yeah, he, he knew that he was in a bad situation in New Jersey and saw that as the only out, really. So, I, if anything, you excuse. should find Ilya Kovalchuk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He, you his know, excuses for, for, for pussing out. Uh, his yeah. excuse when he retired, guys, was he wants to be closer to family in Russia. So, but still, New Jersey shouldn't be getting their first round pick back, regardless. New Jersey fans, you're gonna hate us for it, but you shouldn't. Sorry. Okay, so, Not sorry. so, so we'll, we'll move on from Jersey that one fans. quickly. Now that we've got that out of the way, because Wednesday was the trade deadline, and a lot of stuff happened. So we're going to get right into it because the, the biggest deal of the day might have been the first one that happened real early in the morning. Martin San Louis finally got his wish, shipped up to the New York Rangers in, in, in a swap for Ryan Callahan. This is a deal that almost came together actually right after the Olympics, but 
uh, New, New York actually had to send a couple picks with Callahan to get San Luis. They sent a first rounder in 2015 and a second rounder this year that becomes a first if Tampa Bay makes the Eastern Conference Finals. So I want to get your guys' takes. We'll start with Kelvin on this one. Who do you think came out on the better end of this deal? Uh, I think the Rangers did just based on what they're going to get back. If you look at St. Louis this year, he has 61 points. He's got 29 goals, 32 assists, mm -hmm. compared to Callahan's 14 and 11. So you're getting a better offensive player than Callahan in return for St. Louis. So St. Louis makes the Rangers a better team offensively. Does it make them a contender to go to the finals? No. But it puts them in a better spot and in a wide open Eastern Conference right now. The Eastern Conference is by far the weaker conference of the two right now. So this first round pick plus it turns well, it turns into a first rounder. And I believe if he re signs they also get Tampa Bay's seventh round pick. Yeah, yeah, they got like a second rounder from Tampa Bay. In 2015. In yeah. 2015. And then New York would send like a seventh rounder or something like that. To it's like yeah, a fifth New or a fifth goes to New York or, or to Tampa Bay and a seventh would go to New York or something like that or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah, it's second goes to Tampa if he re-signs. No, if they go, if he doesn't re-sign. Yeah, if you go, get, if he re-signs, they get a second. If they don't, they get a seventh. If you guys want to read a whole lot of conditions, you should check out all the stipulations and the picks that were involved in the Ryan Miller deal because there's six or seven different scenarios that the Sabres there's could so end up with picks. There's so many things with the Sabres deal, but all indications Ryan Miller re-signing, so it's going to be a first-round pick. So yeah. So my, Michael, I want to get I want to get your take on this because Boston and Pittsburgh right now are still kind of the top two dogs in the East, but the Rangers and Tampa are both kind of you know riding on their heels and definitely thinking they can make some moves. Do you think this changes the playoff race at all in the East? Uh, a bit, and personally for me, I'm, I'm actually going to have to disagree with Kelvin on this one. I think Tampa Bay got the better end of the deal here because you give up a 38-year-old Marty St. Louis. Granted, he's still got some some gas in the tank, but he's 30 years old, and you get two first rounds potentially out of a 38-year-old plus a guy who's, going, you know, who's 26, 27 years old. He's going to be a workhorse for you. He's going to probably get you, you know, 20 goals, potentially 25 playing with Steven Stamkos. Uh, he's going to be a leader on and off the ice. He's going to be a jack-of-all-trades type of guy. Uh, he's he's going to keep his mouth shut. He's not going to argue with management. I mean, personally, I think, you know, Tampa got the better into this, and I think they got a hell of a shot to make the Eastern Conference Finals this year. It will be it either against Pittsburgh or Boston um, if, uh, you know, if Tampa Bay doesn't have to go through one or the other. Uh, so that that could potentially be two first round picks there for a 38 year old winger. I mean, you know, I uh, granted, I mean, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. There's no question, Marty St. Louis is going to be a Hall of Famer. So I mean, it's a uh, it's very possible for Tampa Bay to do this. Uh, they got you know Stamkos back, like I said, Ben Bishop's playing lights out, except for last night. Um, but I mean, Ben hey, Bishop you didn't know, start in that last night. Oh uh, well, well, okay, well, back, that yeah. works out then. That works out then. <laughs> but yeah, still, you know, there's 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 talks of. Bishop for the Vesna, um, John Cooper for you know Jack Adam being coach of the year uh, for doing all of this for without Steven Samkos, um, and I I would even right now despite the fact of what Nathan McKinnon is doing in Colorado, Tyler Johnson is my Calder pick. I mean the guy's been playing lights out. He's an undrafted free agent, um, helped Syracuse win the Calder Cup down in the AHL. Yeah, you know he picked up some slack. He, I think he's got like you know 18 goals. Um, and this is for you know for an undraft, <clears throat> excuse me, an undrafted rookie, who's actually helping out my fantasy team. Thank you, Tyler Johnson. Uh, and you know you got guys like Johnson, Alex Kilhorn, Andre Palat, um, even uh, you know a guy like Radko Gouda. Some of those Syracuse guys who played through John Cooper's system kind of reminds me of when uh, Bruce Boudreau came up through the Washington system, came up with Hershey, um, and then. Like I think it was like 08 or 09 when he actually came up and everything and brought those guys with him. They had that nice team, kind of build it to where Washington is now. I think Tampa Bay has a, a great shot to do the exact same thing and could potentially be in the Eastern Conference Finals at the end of the year. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think this model of teams getting a group of guys together, winning at the AHL level, and then moving them all up to the NHL together is really working. I think... We're, we're probably about a year behind where Tampa Bay is at with Ottawa because the Binghamton team was loaded for a while. 
Oh yeah. And now they've they've got a bunch of players up there in Ottawa that are going to be really good for, you know. And, and years keep to your come. eyes out. Keep your eyes out in a couple years. Matt Puempo, who's a former first rounder in 2010 or 2011, kids tearing it up down there in Binghamton. He's going to be a force to be reckoned with when he gets to Ottawa. Yeah, Mike, Mike Hoffman too is another guy that's been oh, doing yeah. it big and there, he's, and now he's, he's now he's up now. with Ottawa. So. Yeah. I mean, that, that, guy's, that guy's got playmaker written all over him. Yeah, go back to this trade. i got to agree with Michael, though. I think Tampa Bay definitely came out on the better end of the deal. You know, you know, all things, all good things come to an end, and even though San Luis had 14 great years in Tampa Bay, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, they've got to move on from him, and now they've got a chance to sign a great leader and two-way forward in Ryan Callahan. They've got possibly two more first-round picks, and they have, um, what, what's his name? Oh, you know, what's his name? Jonathan Drouin waiting to come up. Oh, yeah, up. that it, guy, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, yeah, that guy, you know, the afterthought to Nathan McKinnon. Uh, yeah, Drew Drew Ann could be there next year. I mean, yeah. they have so much young talent; it's ridiculous. It's not even, not even funny. And Tampa Bay is going to be a serious contender in the East for a really long time. And personally, I don't know what Marty St. Louis was worried about. Yeah, you got you didn't make the Canadian all the Canadian Olympic team, but you eventually got on the team and you won a gold medal. What are you complaining about? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe he just uh, well, felt I, by Steve. Yeah, but, but you see, from what Steve, from what I understood in the press conference, Steve said that he wanted him on the team, and everybody else said no. So I don't know what. Why is he mad at Steve? He should be mad at everybody else. Maybe there's something under the surface, and he really just wanted to close out his career with Brad Richards again. This you is know? true. Hey, you know. Who knows? We'll, we'll we will never know the full story about this whole thing, but yeah, we'll probably we'll probably know about it in three or four years. But in the meantime, we'll move on from it. Uh, you guys the, hear me? What's yeah, up? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, my stuff's not moving, so I'm making sure. Technical difficulties. That's yeah, all good. Yeah. Um, next team we're going to move on to is the Vancouver Canucks because Ryan Kessler was rumored to be on the trade block, and he was probably, I mean, not really arguably, the biggest name at the trade deadline, but he wasn't the guy that the Canucks traded. They were actually able to trade Roberto Luongo, the one guy who thought, who we all thought was untradeable from their team. Luongo actually got traded the day before the deadline, but he got sent to Florida, and I thought Vancouver got two really good players. They got a prospect goalie in Jakob Markstrom, who's six foot six, twenty four years old. He's a you know could be, still be a stud in the making, and they got a they got a center to build around a young guy in Sean Mathias, who was kind of gotten got buried on the Florida depth chart, and now he's got another chance in Vancouver. So what do you guys make of this? We're gonna start with Michael. I mean. I never really saw Luongo getting moved, but even more shocking to me, I don't think I saw Kessler staying. Well, you know, I mean, it was it was a complete and total shock to see, you know, Kessler stay. Um, but I could see why, you know, Mike Gillisley would, would would do that. I mean, not to get ahead of ourselves in topics, but with guys like, you know, like Matt Molson, Thomas Vanek going for, you know, mere second-round picks, and you've got a bare cupboard in your uh, in your farm system, there's no way that, you know, if I'm Mike Gillisley, I would have done the same thing. I wouldn't move Ryan Kessler for next to nothing like some of these guys did. I'd be run out of town. Um, now, when, when you when you move a guy like Roberto Luongo, again, you know, who we all thought was untradeable with that contract and everything, I thought that was a year too late. Uh, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, a couple years ago, here we were looking at Florida winning its Southeast Division title and, you know, taking the New Jersey Devils to seven games and, now they started from the bottom again. So, I mean, you know, eventually they're going to undrake themselves, and, you know, now they're, you know, they're there. And um, But I think that actually in itself was a good, you know, you, you hear the term hockey move thrown around a lot these days. That was a good hockey move for Dale Talon in Florida because now you've got a guy that you can say, hey, we can build around Roberto Luongo. Granted, it's an aging Roberto Luongo. But if anything, you can use Roberto Luongo as a marketing tool to bring guys to South, you know, to South Florida, and say, "Hey, we've got a guy here. We believe in him. We can build around him. He's, he, you know, he's got playoff experience. You can come play for us and play with Roberto Luongo." I think some guys would really want to do that. So, if anything, the Luongo deal to Florida kind of makes sense now, even for the future. I mean, granted, Jakob Markstrom is a tough, was a tough prospect to get rid of, but he was buried in Florida. And if you're buried behind Scott Clemenson, something's wrong. I don't know if it's the goaltending coach down in Florida. I don't know if it's um, Markstrom himself, uh, if he just needed to change his scenery. But the guy was 
set up in Louisville with the Swedish Elite League a, f- a few years ago when he was drafted. Um, so I mean, the, the maybe the maybe the number's still out, but I, I was I'm still not sold on Kessler being a Vancouver Canuck at the beginning of next season. I think he'll be traded at the at the draft. Yeah, yeah, Kelvin, let's swing this over to you. What do you think the future holds for Ryan Kessler? Well, they're not releasing anything out, but I think he is definitely trade bait at the draft. And it shouldn't surprise us that he stayed at this trade deadline because same thing happened with Luango last season. Everybody thought he was shipped off to Toronto. Toronto already had the jerseys made, ready to sell, and then he doesn't go anywhere. And we did the same thing this year. Talked about Vancouver, biggest name on the block. Ryan Kessler didn't go anywhere. Interest didn't really pick up till around 2.30, 3 o'clock-ish, where you actually even heard anybody talking about Kessler being possibly shipped, and that was to Pittsburgh. But that was a fake account on Twitter, so don't follow fake accounts on Twitter like I got caught up in. Stupid LeBron. Crap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pierre LeBron's real Twitter handle actually says "real LeBron." So, watch out for fake accounts, everybody. Shout out to fake Pierre so LeBron. <laughs> More shout outs for him because they already got enough of them on TSN. Yeah, I, uh, sport, <laughs> Sports Kings. We, we usually give a shout out to our founder Jason Whitney. I don't think we've done that enough today. So, shout yeah, out to, shout Jason, to Whitney. Jason Whitney. Humble shout out. I, yeah, we I need think to get the servers back up. <laughs> yeah, we're working on a big overhaul these days. <laughs> I, th- I think with Kessler, you know, maybe, you know, myself included, I think we all got a little hyped up for the big blockbusters after Stan Louis and Callahan fell. But, you know, Mike Gillis definitely proud of him for not, you know, budging and taking a package less than what he wanted. You know, they definitely need to find a center that could be a second-line guy for the future and maybe even a first-line guy for the future because Henrik Sedin is, what, 34 at this point? They really don't have anybody else at center. Yeah, they're both up the there, pipeline. and they're both hurt all the time. Yeah. 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 I, oddly enough for the Sedins. So everything's been kind of downhill in Vancouver. I think Gillis definitely needs to be, you know, working lines and seeing if he can drive the price up for Kessler. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. at, the, at the draft maybe we'll see some movement there. And I, I'm going to make a – Go ahead, Kelvin. I'm going to make a bold prediction. Kessler to Buffalo with Buffalo's picks. Bold prediction. Whoa. With all the picks uh, Buffalo has. If, if they want a center in that, though, do you That's think that could possible. be uh, Grigorenko, who's not working out so far with Buffalo? Grigorenko, they've already said once that they're looking to trade him after his incident, not reporting to to, uh, to Russia there. So wouldn't surprise me one bit. Well, now that I'd, say Grigor- I'd send him down there. Now yeah, that he, ha- now that he has week. gone back, I mean, he, he did, yeah, now that he did report, he's been doing very well. But I, I think, you know... I said this before the show that it could happen at the deadline, and I'm going to stick to it. I think Kessler becomes a Philadelphia Flyer in the end because that's an American team, and nobody can offer them a prospect like Braden Shen. So I'm going to stick to my guns on that. I think Kessler to Philadelphia by the draft. So they sent Shen and Giroux? No, no, no. 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 Claude Giroux is never no. leaving Philadelphia. Claude Giroux is a mainstay in Philadelphia. If that man leaves, he's not, he's he's not leaving right. Philadelphia until he's at they least They will like burn Philadelphia down. If Claude Drew is ever traded, but hey, you know, it's a city I, I, of brotherly love. Yeah, nowhere <laughs> near it. Anyways, I <laughs> let me. I, I reiterated this on Wednesday, guys, and I had Ray Ferraro reiterate it for me um, after our last show. All they have, all all Vancouver has in their prospect pile that is ready, that is NHL ready right now, is Nick Jensen. Denmark kid, he's 23 years old. He's playing down in, over in Utica. Um, He's, he's it. All their other prospects are three, four years down the road. So with Kessler, they need, you know, a, if not one, maybe two guys that are, you know, prospect NHL ready. And again, Gillisley apparently didn't find that. So, I mean, again, you know, I think we both hit this nail on the head way too many times. But, you know, good for Mike Gillisley for not budging. Absolutely. So now what we'll move into is uh, the, the market for – guys that are unrestricted free agents and, you know, top six scoring forwards because there were a ton of them on the market and not a lot of teams that really wanted to pay the huge prices for them. So the Los Angeles Kings really got that started by trading for Marion Gabrick. And then closer to the trade deadline at 3 p.m., you saw Matt Molson get moved to the Wild. You saw Thomas Vanek get moved to the Canadians. Oh, and uh, Mike Camilleri. And Mike Camilleri with, with the Flames didn't get moved at all. 
So, uh, you know, we'll start with uh, Calvin on this one. Calvin, what do you, who do you think got the best deal for their uh, rental score? Well, with all the names out there, I would say probably the Canadians got the better end of the deal. Just because they got a fighter back, which they needed, in Cody McCormick, and they got Molson. Wild, you mean? To give up, yeah, that's just what I meant. The Wild didn't have to give up much to get him either. They got gave up a second rounder in Tory Mitchell, so it's not like they gave up a crap ton to get him. And then you got Gabrick. Gabrick's thirty-two went to LA. They needed another top six forward. And Gabrick in 651 games had 306 goals, which is 47% like a goal per game, and that's ranked fourth in the league among active players. So L.A. probably a close second just because of what they had to give up. To pick up Gabrick would be second. Yeah, the, yeah, the Kings thing. didn't have to give up that much. They they gave yeah, up keep... Matt Fradden, who's you know middle six right winger, more of a physical guy, and a, and, and a second round pick and a conditional third round pick. So yeah. it's really not that much compared to um, you know what was given up for Molson and Vanek. But Mike, I want to ask you about this because the Islanders really, I think they didn't get anything for Thomas Vanek, and they definitely got the worst end of this trade that's kind of been happening over the course of this year. Uh, what do you think of? Uh, Garth Snow and uh, what he was able to do with Vanek at the deadline. I think Garth Snow should be shot personally. I mean, first of all, you screw up your entire team chemistry when you trade Matt Molson, who is John Tavares' like best buddy, to Buffalo with a first round pick and a second round pick, and you get a guy who is an unrestricted free agent himself who doesn't want to be there. And then of course, you know, you sit into this like decline of Western civilization proportions fall completely out of anybody's race, um, and then you end up trading him to, of all teams, Le Habs, the Canadiens, for Sebastian Kohlberg and a conditional second-round pick that doesn't even exist if Montreal doesn't make the playoffs. And there's always that chance, since Carey Price is still out injured with a lower body injury. And now, I'm not, there's, this is, this is not any, any knock on Sebastian Kohlberg if, if the, you know, Word holds up and Colbert becomes what they say Colbert is going to become. He's going to be a good player. But is he going to be a Thomas Vanek? Probably not. So, I mean, in all senses, I think, you know, Garth Snow, if if I were Islanders brass, I'd, I'd, I'd ax Garth Snow at the end of the season and start again. I mean, granted, it was, you know, a couple years we were talking about, you know, the Islanders are going to be, you know, they're back in 2015. Well, now with this, I think it's going to be another three or four years before they even, you know, get anywhere close. Um, but, you know, I mean, L.A. kind of, you know, made out late gangbusters, uh, giving up Fratton uh, for Marion Gabrick. Uh, I think we all remember the last time these two teams traded what happened. Uh, some guy named Jeff Carter comes over to L.A., ignites this offense, and drives them all the way to the Stanley Cup as an eighth seed, which they end up winning. Um, but Fratton, I mean, you know, he gets traded twice in the same season. He's 24, oh, yeah. 25 years old. Um, he's, I think he's got an actually a good opportunity in Columbus. I think that was a good, good move for him, uh, personally, because he's, he's now got a shot to be a third line guy with a potential, you know, chance to be a second line guy, kind of like an RJ Umberger, uh, type of player who, you know, he can score, but he's also a, a, a really solid defender and he's not going to be scratched every night like he was pretty much in, um, in LA plus uh, with, um, with the Kings, they're so deep at forward. You got guys like Tanner Pearson, Tyler Toffoli, who's going to be a monster. Lyndon Vague. You had Brandon Cozen um, earlier, who's playing with his buddy, his his Calgary Hitman buddy Martin Jones in Manchester and in LA. And then they shipped him off to, before shipping him off to Toronto. Um, so I mean, in, despite the fact that both Minnesota and LA got you know great rental players, if you even really want to call. Molson, a rental player, because I think there's a really good shot that he stays in Minnesota with Zach Parise and guys like that. I think the value that was gotten back 
was just atrocious on these things. Especially, I mean, we can we can do a whole other show about why the Islanders did what the Islanders did. But the whole, the the trade deadline as a whole was like that. And we were just sitting there waiting for the big deal, and we it never really, aside from the Callahan thing, it never came. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing too is that, as you mentioned, Molson possibly staying in Minnesota. It's been a rumor for basically a year and a half that. Thomas Vanek, you know, the former University of Minnesota star, could go back home there. Yeah, you know, they're, they're still unrestricted free agents. And I don't know if Vanek really fits with Montreal long term. No. I don't know if they decide that he's a guy that stays there. So I, mean, I think there's definitely a lot of movement that will still happen this offseason among these guys. And he's got the speed there. I mean, they, they, need, they need a guy like that to compliment a guy like, you know, a Brendan Gallagher or a Max Packer, Patcher, or Pacioretty. Despite the fact that everybody says Patrick, right? it's a CK. Come on, guys. Um, you know, it's uh, it's possible. I don't think it'll happen. I think he he hits the market. Um, Molson is probably the one that's probably going to stay. Uh, and I, I think Gabrick hits the market too if he's you know a UFA. So I'm, which I and honestly I was shocked that he was traded. Yeah. So we'll move on real quick. One of our last few topics. I know we want to sneak in about the Buffalo Sabres because they were one of the most active teams at the deadline, obviously. As you can see, we've got two local guys up here. So we just want to talk real quick about the future of that team, and we'll start with Kelvin because the Sabres were incredibly active at the trade deadline, and Tim Murray's really doing all that he can to get this team in a position to win. So, Kelvin, why don't you just give us you know, your take on the Sabres at the trade deadline and what you think they have to do moving forward now. Love it, love it, love it. It needed to be done three, four years ago under Regeer, but Regeer was too gung-ho and not wanting to do anything because he didn't want to lose his job. Well, guess what, Regeer? You're gone. We brought in fresh young blood, Tim Murray. Love the guy. If I ever see him, I'm going to buy him a beer and be like, thank you for finally turning this team around, getting it going in the right direction, I believe. Did we give up a young defenseman? Yes, McNabb. We gave up McNabb, but the two forwards we're getting back – in Feshing and I don't even want to say his last name, Nick Delorier. Nick Delorier. Yeah, Delorier. Yeah. Delorier is tearing it up right now in the AHL. He's the leading scorer for the Monarchs team before coming over to Buffalo. He's going straight to he's going straight to Rochester. I'm gonna be going to see him here in a couple weeks. I'm coming up to Buffalo on Sunday for the Blackhawks game. So looking forward to that. Looking forward to it. Brand new atmosphere. It's exactly what Buffalo needed. They got rid of Halak. They got some more. They lost two draft picks in the L.A. deal, which were L.A.'s to begin with. So thank you, Darcy Regeer, for giving us those two picks to send back to L.A. for Robin Regeer. Um, but Buffalo's going in the right direction. They got they got a bright young future, and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun yeah. rebuild. Definitely I think it worked out well with those uh, second-round picks that got sent back from McN- yeah. with McNabb is that they picked up two more seconds to make up for it from Minnesota for Tory Mitchell. From the Minnesota deal, yep. So I, th- I think the Sabres, you know, uh, the, the one thing I saw is that was really interesting to me is that after all the movement with Thomas, with Thomas Vanek, the Sabres have now turned Thomas Vanek and, you know, Cody McCormick, random grinder guy, into Tory Mitchell, who is a solid penalty killer, bottom six forward, three second round picks, and the Islanders first either this year or next year, which I think there's a real pick that real chance that the Islanders keep that pick and the Sabers uh, get the 2015 pick to go to take another chance at Connor McDavid or Jack Eichel or whoever you know else ends up at the top of the 2015 draft. I think giving up Braden McNabb was something that had to happen. I think he was passed by guys on the organizational depth chart that are ready to go right now, and they've got plenty of guys that are coming up right behind him hot on his tail. So it's just kind of a numbers game, and somebody had to go. But I love the deal they got with Los Angeles for McNabb because Hudson Fashing is tearing it up right now at the University of Minnesota. The only reason he fell to the fourth round is because going into the draft of 2013, he had such a bad season with the U.S. Yeah. Uh, national team. So he's a guy that's 6'3", 215, big right winger. He even drew some comparisons to Dustin Brown I was reading about while he was there in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. That is exactly the kind of guy that the Sabres are going to need to build around for the future. Um, Michael, you got anything to say on this? 
Oh, of course. Do I never have not anything to say on anything? I mean, come on, guys. No, I, I thought that the uh, I thought that the McNabb deal was actually good for both teams. Um, with McNabb going to L.A., you get a guy who can eventually replace. Um, you know, I mean, you got guys like Willie Mitchell, who's in his upper 30s. He's like 35 or 36. He's probably gone at the end of the year. Uh, Matt Green's an unrestricted free agent. You probably don't want to sign that guy. So next season, you put Braden McNabb in there with a Jake Muzzin. There's your third pairing right there. Um, with L.A.'s defensive prospects, they're not really as deep as their forwards. I mean, they do have Derek Forbert, who's uh, their first-round pick from 2008. He spent four years at the University of North Dakota. Um, and he's actually uh, in his rookie year at Manchester right now. But Buffalo's getting a hell of a prospect in Nick Delorier. He was a def- he can play defense. He can play forward. So he's kind of going to be like a Brent Burns type of guy. They may leave him at forward since there's so many defensemen in Buffalo right now. Um, and Hudson Fashing before the season started last year, before you know all the uh, the horrible you know times that he had in with the development team. There were talks of him being a first rounder like a mid to late first rounder, he was that good. Um, so, I mean, that's that's definitely going to be a guy that uh, that you Buffalo fans are going to look forward to, you know, in the next five years and say, wow, I'm really glad we got that guy. Uh, Halak coming to my Capitals. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're excited about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going to lie to you guys. When the deal was announced after the trade deadline, I, uh, I was running around my uh, living room in my apartment complex, jumping around, hyperventilating almost. And then I got to thinking about it. Why did we make the deal? The whole time I was waiting for a defenseman because Braden Holpe cannot stop anywhere from 35 to 40 shots a night and expect us to win. See the Boston game last night where he stopped 40, uh, 43 shots and we still lost. 43 shots on goal, guys. Come on, you can't be doing that. And Yaroslav Buffalo Halak's Jr. To, yeah, and, and, and Yaroslav Halak's supposed to help that? Granted, he may be an upgrade, but I mean... It's, it's just kind of it, – it's a good move, and it's a bad move. I mean, we obviously didn't really give up anything for him. Um, getting rid of Martin Egrat was a godsend, uh, and I was actually really looking forward to Rusty Klesla. I was actually talking to uh, one of our other ATR contributors and DC site manager, Stephen Kettner, about this like a few months ago saying, you know, Rustislav Kessler is going to be a guy that we can go after cheap at the trade deadline. And it eventually happens, and then we turn him right around for Yaroslav Halak. Buffalo's getting Michael Neuvert back. Neuvert wasn't happy about being in number two. And personally, I don't think that he's going to be, even be able to be a number one in Buffalo. I don't think I, I think Buffalo right now has two solid number twos in net and no real number one, uh, which you know could eventually change uh, with either this draft, maybe go after a guy like Thatcher Demko um, or Alexander Nedeljkovic. But, I, mean, I you know, say we Buffalo, wait till 2015 for that. That's that's there. There's also with that too. Um, but you know, I mean, uh, I think Tim Murray has got a, a a big step in the right direction for what was given back to him for what he gave up. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see how this goes with Buffalo. I mean, as a hockey fan in general, I'm anxious to see what happens. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think in goal, the Sabers are going to be just fine because this is the exact same thing that happened after Dominic Hasek left. That then the Sabers go to you know Marty Baron, Mika Noren, and Ryan Miller. You know they kind Whoa, of play Mika around with, and... they they kind of play around with a couple of prospects and see you know who comes out on top. And you know luckily they were able to find another elite guy so soon after the Dominator left. Um, right now I'm going to give a quick shout out to SabersProspects.com and Chris Baker because that guy is all over all the Sabers prospects you could possibly have. And uh, he's there's a couple goalies right now that he's pretty high on. Uh, Linus Olmark over in Sweden, and uh, Cal Peterson playing in Waterloo, the USHL, I believe. So I think, or maybe, or maybe he's in college. I forgot. Wait, does the same Linus Olmark? Olmark, Olmark with a U. Oh wow! So you know, th- there's still a lot of guys that you know they could come up with, and you know, I mean, if Enroth keeps playing like he did last night against Tampa Bay, there's your number one right there. I mean. He was absolutely phenomenal that night, last night. Forty-four shots, one goal, forty-three yeah, saves. Forty-three Please. on forty-four. I don't even want to think about how high he the save a, percentage is on that because that's insane. It's like a nine his something. La- he's three and one in his last four starts. Went in before after before the trade with Miller had one 
win all year and two wins in the past two years. It was like two fifteen and six in before the Miller trade, and now he's three and one when he's stopping thirty six shots a night on average. So <laughs> that just points to Buffalo needing a whole new overhaul on defense, but. They're getting there. Their their AHL and their lower ranked level teams are stacked defensively. Trust me, you get Buffalo fans, suck it up for one more year, and after that we'll be okay. We're going in the right direction. I don't want to see Tim Murray's a dip stick on Facebook <laughs> anymore. I don't want to see it on the site I work for. I don't want to see it anywhere because we're finally going in the right direction. Trust us. We're we are going in the right direction. Amen. We're man. Going forward. Amen. So uh, we're coming down to the end of the show here, and uh, I think we just want to run some winners and losers down because there were surely a lot of trades that we didn't get to cover in the last half hour plus or so. So we'll run right, right down the line back to me. We'll start with Kelvin. Um, you know, closing remarks on winners and losers. Uh, my biggest winner is going to be Buffalo Sabres. We just talked about them. They're a team that's at the bottom. Where do you start? You started from the bottom. Now you're here. They gotta get to the Still here, the but they're at the bottom right now. But they're gonna get to the here. Trust me, guys. They're the biggest winners. They still have stockpiled draft picks. They got rid of most of their UFAs, and yeah, they kept Chris Stewart. Big deal, I think. Got a year left to see what the kid can do. He's huge. He's big, size wise. Keep the guy. Got hurt looks last like he night. Gotten, yeah, looks like he could have gotten. Yeah, looks like he could have gotten real messed up on a scary I hit. Think with back. I think. Which I don't know why there wasn't a penalty on it, but we're going to get into that later. Um, depending on what happened to Stewart, no matter what, we're still going forward. We got the, we got talent. We got draft picks. We can trade. We need to bring in veteran leadership still, but Buffalo, winner. Loser, New York Islanders. God, they mess up that whole team. Islanders, I don't think there's any help until you get rid of snow. Snow has got to go. The whole front office has to go. You got to start everywhere. You got to pull a Buffalo Sabres and rehaul everything, gut out the old, and bring in new, fresh eyes to run everything. Yeah, Michael. Michael, we'll move it on down to you. What are your closing remarks here? Uh well, before we get to trade. Uh, winners and losers. Shout out to the Philadelphia Flyers organization for jumping John Erskine the other night. I thought that was a really class act move, guys. <laughs> Way to go. And uh, you, Wayne Simmons, if John Erskine ever sees you in a back alley, buddy, it's it's lights out for you, man. He was killing you. He was killing you, man. He was killing you. And then you have to jump in for your buddy Vinny LeCavalier and help out. Vinny LeCavalier <laughs> didn't need any help getting his ass kicked. But, yeah, yeah, the real class act moved by the Philadelphia Flyers organization for jumping John Erskine the other night. I was really uh, really happy about that. But I digress. As a, besides the obvious loser uh, in being the New York Islanders, I, you know, and this is going to be the weirdest thing I'll probably say all day, I, I really thought Pittsburgh kind of lost here. I mean, you, you get – granted, you didn't need a lot, but when you were really in play for Ryan Kessler and you didn't get Ryan Kessler – a move that certainly would have jolted you guys over, you know, probably anybody in the league as Stanley Cup contenders, and you didn't do it, you you, you get Marcel Gotch and Lee Stepniak. I mean, those are solid moves, but when you had the play for Ryan Kessler and you could have gotten him and you had all the pieces and you didn't do it, why not pull the trigger, man? I, I thought you kind of lost out on that one. Um I think the fans kind of lost that a little bit too because we all were, were, were expecting the big one and it, it never really occurred. But, I mean, I'd have to say Tampa Bay wins on this one. Getting what they got for a 38-year-old winger, I, I thought that was that was genius by Steve Eiserman. Um, that's, 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 that's about it, I mean, winner-wise. I thought there were some good moves. Uh, there weren't great moves. Um I thought the Alish Hemsky deal was actually a, a solid move for Ottawa. It was a low risk, high reward type thing. He gets the uh, the thrill of a playoff hunt, something he hasn't seen since 2006 when they went to the Stanley Cup Finals and lost in seven to Carolina. Um, he'd been in Edmonton for like four, 13 years. Um, drafted back in 01, and he's been on the, there ever on since. the trade block for eight of those years. Yeah, it, exactly. Like so I mean. The, the, the declining production 
uh, kind of said, uh, you know, uh, here's another D. Snyder reference. I'm just not going to take it anymore. Scores two goals against Ottawa, and Ottawa trades for him. So we're going to see what's going to happen with that. Um, he's playing with an actual center now in Jason Spezza, uh, a veteran guy who's going to be able to help him out. Uh, so I'm, I'm really anxious to see what him, uh, Milan McCulloch, what, he, what they're going to do together uh, as a team. Uh, and we'll see if they can make a playoff push. I mean, they were they were kind of lying in the weeds a little bit with the whole Eastern Conference, with the wild card now being as, as tight as it is. It's separated by like three, maybe four points tops. Uh, you know, a move like that, it, it might push – I'm not saying it's going to push Ottawa into the playoffs, but it might get them pretty close. I mean, we're, we're going to see what happens with this last, uh, this last uh, little bit of the season. Yeah, I mean, I think a good second-line right winger there, that might be enough for them to sneak out the eighth spot. Um, before I give my winners and losers honorable mention that I couldn't really sneak in here, I'm going to go with the Detroit Red Wings because they've had trouble with guys at center getting injured all year, and then they go and pick up a guy like David Legwand at the very last minute of the deadline. Legwand's having a pretty solid year. He put up 40 points, I want to say 30 assists with Nashville, and he's a guy that's going to come in, and uh, long as Henrik Zetterberg might be out for the year. So, you know, and Dotsu to... shut down for three weeks. And Stephen Weiss, too. I don't know if he's back yet, but he's I don't been, think uh... he's coming to come back. Yeah, he's he's been I mean, really he's, banged he's up. Out. So, Le- so Legwan's a guy that can come in and he's a reliable veteran. And I think he's fitting really well to the Detroit system. But Detroit that's not native too. Oh wow. Okay, I didn't even notice that. Fantastic. Detroit native he played with the Plymouth Whalers, so he knows the area. Um Lifelong Nashville Predators, the first player ever drafted in Nashville uh, Predators history. Yep. So it's 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 an end of an era in Nashville as well. But yeah, I think that that's a that's a great a uh, a a great uh, a great acquisition for Detroit and nice find, Joe. That was that definitely. Was, that was one I'm, I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna lead off with my loser so that we can close on a winner's note. My loser actually is gonna be Anaheim because Ooh. they cleared out Justin Penner to the Capitals and they were primed to make a move for. Uh, you know, another top line guy. I think you know a lot of reports were saying that they wanted Ryan Kessler. There was no way Vancouver was going to deal him in the conference, so they needed to make a move. I thought for Matt Molson or Thomas Vanek, and they didn't get either of them. So I think uh, you know their best bet right now is to slide in a young guy next to Getzlaff and Perry. Maybe Jacob Silverberg. Maybe Emerson Edom. Emerson Edom. Yeah. But you know. I think I think they could have done a lot better. They you know could have made a, made a couple of moves. So um, you know, and when LA was improving as much as they did, and with St. Louis picking up Brian Miller, I uh, you know I got to give the loss to Anaheim there. And uh, for my winner, I'm going to go to Los Angeles because they won big in my opinion because they got they got their new secondary scorer in Marion Gabrick, who you know. I don't think he's going to resign there, but that's the guy that pushes them into uh, contention for the Stanley Cup for sure. And they pick up Braden McNabb, who I think is the guy that's probably going to fit into their top six, top seven right away. And the amazing thing is that they did all that without breaking up their forward prospect pool. They didn't trade Tanner Pearson. They didn't trade Tyler Toffoli. They didn't trade Lyndon Bay. They pulled off something really amazing at the deadline, I think, by sticking to their guns, by keeping their prospects. And you know, huge shout out to GM Dean Lombardi and his staff for doing all Very, that. Yeah, and and real quick, Joe, if I may, for like a, a last ditch effort. Sure. I thought it was kind of thought it was kind of odd that Columbus would end up trading a guy like Marion Gabrick when they were in a playoff hunt like that. Um, you know, maybe maybe Yarmo Kekalainen knows something that we don't know. Um, but I think that the Anaheim move when they dumped Dustin Penner, um, I think they dumped and then they got stuff. They ended up getting Stefan Robida, which you know that's that's okay and everything. Nice little play, uh, playoff addition for a depth guy. I think a lot of that is to resign Jonas Hiller. Hiller's an unrestricted yeah. free mm-hmm. agent at the end of the year. Um, he's going to uh, acquire. He's going to want Buku Dolores. Um, and I don't think if you know with, when they ship out Victor Foss to Edmonton, which by the way Edmonton is another winner. And I I just thought about this Edmonton. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they, up shoot, Victor Foss. they have yeah. Victor Foss for next season. They signed Ben Scrivens. They've finally got goaltending, something they have not had in years. You get a defenseman in Edmonton. It's it's very possible that within the next couple of years, Edmonton creeps into the playoffs. I I'm and they finally put together all that because they finally that have for the last they years. finally have goaltending. They have, that's something they've been plaguing them for years with Devin Dubnik. Um, so Edmonton could possibly be a winner, but Jonas Hiller 
is going to be re- it has to be re-signed by um, by the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. I mean, granted, you've got a guy, a young guy like Frederick Anderson, who's 23, 24 years old, tearing excuse me, tearing it up as a rookie. And um, John Gibson too. I was just about to say yep. that John Gibson is going to be an absolute stud goaltender. He's actually just led Norfolk now. Um, Norfolk is tied with Binghamton right now in the division, in the in the toughest division in the American Hockey League, where first through fourth place is separated by four points. Um, and in fact, actually, fourth place is um, is Hershey right now, and Hershey's actually out of the playoffs, four points out of their division lead, and they're out of the playoffs right now. So that's how tight the East is in the AHL, and a guy like John Gibson is really pushing Norfolk right now. Um, so I don't, I don't want to, you know, discredit. I, I disagree with you a little bit with Anaheim winning, losing, because that is a, that's a bigger hockey move there. But I mean, this is, this has been an interesting trade deadline, and I can't wait to do this again for the draft because that's, that's where oh, things definitely. are really, that's where things are really going to get interesting. So man, a lot, a lot of good talk today, guys. Michael, Calvin, thanks for joining me. On behalf of Sports-Kings.com, I'm Joe. Thanks for I'm tuning Mike. in to Kings of the Ring. Calvin. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter, ATR Sports Kings. Have a good day, everyone. See you guys.